So we'll move on to our fifth presentation for today and I'm joined by Des Ryan, a disability advocate based in Rockhampton. Welcome Des, good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of the public record, Des, before you make your uh, comments, would you please just state your name and uh, whether you're representing yourself? Uh, yes, my name is Desmond Ryan, I'm based in Rockhampton and I represent myself. I come with the, with the values of working for community solutions, of course, in this employment area, and also being the Q, QDN chair at the department. Thank you, Des. Would you like to make your uh, comments? Yeah, well, I mean, your report was pretty comprehensive, much more comprehensive than what I'm sort of initially expecting, but I suppose it's comes with the territory and um, the points you made in your report, about 21% of the Queensland respondents, respondents to NDIA surveys have reported that their, that their most recent, that the NDIs helped them find a job is right for them. So this low rate may partly reflect the relatively low proportion of plans, which is in your report with an employment goal. Around 20% of Queensland participants at their most recent review have reported they were in paid employment below the target for the NDI of 24%. They all highlight a few factors that all the people involved in the planning process during the last few years have not been able to achieve improvements of people with disability. And, and really, that's just the, the long history in this area that it's been pretty flatlining the, the participation rate of people with disabilities for years. It's, it's not just a new thing. With all the, you know, the social changes that have happened, with the mainstreaming, mainstreaming of employment, with the, uh, with the fact that people have greater expectations now, people with disabilities, that is, and probably higher education outcomes too, and more services available to get to get them to this stage. Because, like, if if you look back at my history, I had a spinal injury in 1968 when I was 14. So I completed a few years of education, going back to school as best I could with every every truant student or being held back having to write to me in their spare time so that um, I got through a few a few subjects, all five, about five subjects up to grade 12. And that stood me in good stead. But basically, I just went back into, into a shell of reading because it, I was a high level quadriplegic and I went nowhere because what was there to do? There was nothing. It's only in the late 80s really social changes to have started to happen with the, with the Bob Hawke years and he's been there a long time and some of the important social changes resulted in services that started to develop. And late in the 80s, we had a whoopee new service, a wheelchair, one wheelchair camp for the whole of Rocky, and then two, and then more gradually in the 90s. And then the training facilities were coming about education. I started joining a lot of um, social groups and, and built, you know, uh, community, uh, community employment options and a lot of other other community services that were developing. And I was involved with a lot of them. And that volunteer work led to me realising that education was key. And I, and because I, the, the transport factor was there to help me. And then later on, I started to get some service, some care hours. I started to make benefit of that and started going back to study. In a few years, I was having work, and it just shows that it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's without the services. There's no way you can perform and, and become employed because you've, you've got so many impediments in the way. And, you know, we've got to start now looking, because of all these, a lot of these roadblocks have been removed, and the NDIS is there, which is a wonderful support, and it's should really be able to address a lot of those, a lot of the deficits that, that occur in a person's life. Those NDIA planners and the LACs 
should all be sort of um, analysed for their performance over time and they should be assessed on that. And even if it's not released regularly to the public, but internally it should be, they should be assessed and, and then the poor performing ones should be weirded out because it's, it's holding up the whole NDIS, um, the results. You know, with the design of the whole disability employment scheme, it's focused on competition, which means that employers are secondary in a lot of ways, really. The primary focus is on getting, should be on getting the best employee. Yet a small market of people in a region like Rockhampton with disabilities is divided among many or a few providers of disability services. And, and I just can't understand that, why the potential employer, he wants to employ the greatest employee for himself. And sometimes the employee they're being recommended to maybe isn't the best if it's a particular niche, niche role. Why isn't just one provider of dev services in the, in the area as available to the whole pool or if they've all got access to the whole pool? That's, that is the benefit of this regional advantage program which we've funded for for years, which had the potential to choose candidates from any of the providers. It, it's the only sane solution. Unfortunately, of course, it comes up against the human factor. Each of the DES services are very reluctant to share their employee list. I mean, if, we, if the program existed for a longer period of time, and not in the middle of this pandemic, we would have had greater results. The, the service was able to achieve some great results even in the middle of a pandemic. We had a trial ready to roll out with the government department and it wasn't focused on percentage, it was focused on some targets. And if that had come off in this region, the, the potential to roll that out statewide would be amazing across the state. That's just one department. They, they had up to 250 jobs with a certain niche factor of skill. That was a that was a uh, discrete set of skills that would require some training. But once that was in hand, people could provide great service that was a award wage. And we've had other success facts with best things going on over time. The, the, getting back to the report, though, it is excellent. It highlights a lot of de deficiencies and, and, of course, good things. But the federal government has not focused on the employers. What, what I want to see that happen is really focus on the employers. I mentioned there that they've got a employment strategy, a disability employment strategy. Well, I hope they implement it as a matter of, of high by importance because in this region, because we've been able to get some of these employers to, to help us in some of our lobbying and we've had these events where we've had a lot of employers along and we've had the university and councils who are large employers in, in these small regions. And um, they're willing at the moment, the, the university, to look at their um, HR policies because they realise that yes, we, we've met with them, they've agreed that their HR policies are holding back their participation rates for people with multicultural programs because they've, they've been aware of some research just recently that's proved that. So they're willing to be involved with us and with the multicultural community and our regional advantage uh, people to work together, get another large employer so we can use the two HR people together to look at rationalising or doing, working on their HR policies for both so that they, they look at targets and look at improving their participation rates. And once we get that in, that, that it's not going to happen overnight, but it will make available a major change in this whole region. And, and if that is successful, that is something that we rolled out across, across Queensland and across Australia. What, what are the advantage of getting employers involved is that you get the right people, it opens the door, they bring their reputation along, they bring their contacts along, and 
when they speak, people do listen. So I, I'm not aware of all the details of the participant, participant employment strategy that the federal government have had planned, but it sounds to be the answer for what the future needs. You know, this funding's going to finish. Reason on the back that community solutions for their benefit have, have realised some of the potential of it and are going to keep going in some form in this region anyway, at least that I know of, and in the other two, maybe in a different focus. But at the moment, I'll still be working on it for the longer term. And even if I wasn't working, I'd work on it. I think it's it's not really hard and it's... Uh, I can see the winds in the future. Just scroll down so I can read what I'm not going to say. Mm -hmm. so, um, I've, I've covered a bit in my last few remarks, few remarks, some of the things that I've said before. I think anything that motivates and moves employers towards having a critical and informed look at employing people with disabilities should be supported. We've, we, we've had some employers come to our events where they had a successful outcome and they've agreed to talk to us. And one of the guys said, I won't say exactly what he said, he apologised for being such a whatever it was the word he used because he's He's, he'd he'd uh, agreed to meet someone eventually after telling us that it was too hard, it was too much hard work, too much time. He agreed to, was the girl kept coming back asking him, you know, about giving a person with a disability to go. He finally agreed. The, the lad had turned up at quarter to five. He'd gone home at half past four, forgot. And they'd rung him at work at four o'clock, seven o'clock, sorry. And he realised, oh, so he said, yeah, put him on in the kitchen. Now, he's still been there today, he said. He's, he's one of his best workers. He's got him trained up in a lot of other areas. And this is like a common thing, thing that comes through some of these employers that we get, that they that they have a great result. They have someone who turns up and waits for a job and it stays in the job longer. So and the focus of that group is twofold. One is to get that message out there to other employers about the benefits and you know the, the benefits are so much basically what it's about is making a profit and and the other focus of that group is to look at ways of talking to other big companies about starting that process of their HR policies when they're these much larger companies so that they give the wider community a go so that people get a fair go matter whether they're from multicultural background, Amazon, Charles Strait on the back end, or, or those with a disability. The last part of my talk was about independent assessment. I can, I can tell you that surveys that we've done through QDN, and to my knowledge, speaking to people with disabilities, is independent assessment that you with great scepticism. To my knowledge, I could be wrong, the company set up to implement the independent assessment that are not for profit company. What will this mean? The longer term cost of this program, its efforts, to justify its existence, what it'll mean for the future. To me, it just sounds like the rollout of the electrical supply in Queensland and the selling up of Telstra just NBN. One of the main outcomes of both is costs will go up with a negative effect on the user satisfaction and benefits. And I mean, there's a lot of work going into selling independent assessments, and I'm not closing my mind to it, but I think that's going to be a, a roadblock in the longer term benefits for the community as a whole. Mm. That's a summation. Thanks very much, Des, for those um, insights. And as you know, the analysis in our draft report found that the introduction of the NDIS hasn't seen a noticeable improvement in employment outcomes for people with a disability either in Queensland or nationally. And you obviously raised the very important role that employers have 
in um, the employment of people with a disability. But I just wondered what your view, Des, is around whether the, the scheme is supporting the capacity of people with a disability to take up suitable employment opportunities. Well, that's where, that's, without that happening, without, I mean, to be honest, a lot of services, um, I, I come in contact with a lot of carers, as you probably realise, because I'm a high level quad. Uh, and um, for instance, they've told me, oh, the clients now have got support and they don't want to just go to the library, go to the gardens, go to the shopping centre, look at other people spend money and have a coffee. They're, they're some of them are socially, they, they just kind of mix with large groups of people. And well, they've got them into volunteer work and uh, they're quite well accepted, you know, because initially the parents said to me things like, oh, I don't know how it's going to fit in. Uh, but anyway, he's there working and, you know, it's a bit of the full sort and stuff in the back room and quite happy. They all have him any day of the week. So it's just an example of volunteer. Volunteer work isn't even um, examined in our, um, you know, our, uh, when they send those, the census. I think it should be. That's another way to pick it up. Because volunteer work leads to work and it's a, it's, I don't think I would have been working. I, I never applied for a job in my life. I've just had work come up out of the blue to me and uh, and I've, I've been very lucky, but not everyone can be so lucky in having all the contacts. And I just think we shouldn't just look at volunteer work. Like one of the things where this employer group is working on is getting multicultural society to put in some submission for that to a part-time volunteer coordinator who's got some money to pay for the insurance aspect. Just a part-time role. But, you know, volunteer work is, I know there's American statistics which prove it's something in the order of 24% higher chance of employment. So uh, it's, it gives you a rec track record. People look on you favourably. It treats a lot better when you're working as a volunteer. A lot more respect. And, and uh, look, look at the council. They've got a tremendous number of volunteers. And they don't always value them that well as they should or treat them on a fair base. Des, I think volunteers have got a lot of potential too. Just on the issue of workforce shortages in the disability sector, do you see that there are sufficient opportunities for people with a disability to take up opportunities in the disability sector? Uh, I, I really couldn't say that there is a lot. There's a screening role for all carers that, that is patently obvious. I mean, all the services I know are looking for workers and um, there's lots of issues around that and I'm, I'm no expert working in that area. Um, yeah, there is a lot of unmet need there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have all the answers though. Just uh, moving off the topic of employment, be really interested in your uh, insights into uh, the type of plans that are available within the NDIS and the, the benefits of self-managed plans versus other forms of plans in terms of giving participants greatest choice and control. Uh, so in our draft report, we've encouraged, you know, I guess a, an in-depth look at ways to enable participants to take up self-management where that's appropriate. Just wondered if you have a, a reaction to that suggestion in our report. Well, um, I was in your life, your choice before I came into um, self-management and you know, I slowly, I didn't even self-manage, uh, completely manage by your life, your choice at first. And, but then I realised I'm doing all the work. What, what am I doing? I'm sending out invoice to people anyway, or uh, as a, in a private capacity, what's the difference? Uh, and it's not that hard. And uh, I realised you've got to be reliable, you've got to be responsible. You've got to, not everyone can look at their own best interest properly and deal with people. 
sometimes they don't, they're not the best advocate for themselves. I think the one thing I know is that advocacy is critical. It's a critical factor and it's not valued enough for people with disability across their, across their lifespan. And uh, at times, everyone's going to need some advocacy. I, I take your point, though, about employing people with disability. But the one thing that comes back to you've got to be making a profit. Like when, when we searched, when, when we got the employees involved, we wanted a few role models to have at our little, little cocktail parties. Examples. We come across people we couldn't believe. One of these ladies, a young girl who had a, a um, intellectual disability, I think, and she was working in childcare, and she was, had a childcare certificate, and she was a star. And like we were, every day she was like a rock star going to work. She loved these kids. Kids loved her. She couldn't go shopping without being swarmed by kids coming up to her over the lifespan. You know, oh. It, there were just so many inspiring stories come out of that, our little search. And we were thinking, wow, you know, there's so many good things happening. Yeah, these, these employers need the recognition so that, you, like, you can't sell um, Vegemite without talking about Vegemite and advertisements and all that. It might be a great product, but it's got, it, it comes with promotion. And uh, what we've been lucky with our with our regional advantage plan, we've got some money for videos and we produce some great videos. Unfortunately, they're a little bit targeted half and half to people with disability as well as the employer, where really I think it needed to be just solely the employer and we're rolling out one or two now which are going to be just the employer talking to an employer because yeah, it's, I don't feel it's going to be much better for talking to an employer and telling them you're going to feel better by employing someone. Some employers will. There, there are lots of social advantages, but really, when you're running a small to medium business, you know, profit is everything. If you're not making a profit doing it, you know, you know, it's hard to go broke making a profit, you know. And uh, if their employee is turning up, the one thing I know about working over my lifespan is not in... 22 or and earlier, is that the people who turn up are the best employees, the people who are there every day. Most people want to do a fair day's job. And and you, you can work with people who turn up. But when people don't turn up, you can't uh, turn them around or change, you know, give them the training and help them to, you know, if they're going through a bad period, work with them till they come good. So, Des, what do you hear from employers sort of represents the main barriers to employing people with a disability? Is it just a lack of information? I, I think, well, as this, this public has said, you know, too hard, haven't got enough time, you know, he's busy, you know, they don't want to look at that. There's too many unknowns. And the myths are there, you know, people won't turn up reliably, people have got a greater sickness, you know, all, but all the myths are the bunk and fringes and inquiries that are out there, you know, that, that you just got to go searching for them, they're not commonly available. And the stats, you know, that people stay in the job longer, they have no more sick leave than anyone else, they, they turn up and sometimes they're just not just as good as another employee, they're even better, you know, for, like, for instance, Kanga bins in Rockhampton contacted me after they had a new employer. They already had employed people with disabilities because she had a previous experience of working with them, working for Endeavour. And they, they're turning over a million items of bottles and recyclables every every month, I think, a month or a year, a week in Rockhampton. That's because it's nine state, nine different regional sites. That, they, the, the main thing, they need someone to turn up discrete set of skills and it's an award wage and they know we, we can, you know, with, the, with Endeavour or all the other disability groups, there would be some employees in our region who could, there are already some of them working there now. They're, they're, they'll take as many as they can get because over time they keep turning up. And uh, 
from from your perspective and what you hear from from others that you speak to that have NDIS plans, are NDIS employment supports supporting participants in finding and maintaining employment, or are there some areas for improvement there? Oh, uh, to be honest, with my role, I'm not sure I could really comment on that. I, I, I my focus is with employers and uh, and with you know keeping it keeps me busy. I'm not I'm not going to meeting. I'm involved a lot more in this disaster disaster prevention now, and uh, I've got you know the disability inclusive disaster management group and all that and all the disaster recovery and that thing. So it, it truncates your exposure to every focus and what other people's um, benefits the end of the I know it's been great for me in that. But then, you know, uh, because you, you you monitor your costs and keep your costs down, you have private workers and you're not paying at the top level of what the standard rate is, then they reevaluate your your package down. And then when you one of your carers leaves, you try to find people at market rates and have to pay a service. And your package is getting whoop, knocked about tremendously. Mm. So you realize, oh, you know, you gotta keep fine tuning it. You just keep in there and you, once you find a good LAC and then you just keep going back and mm. follow the rules. You've just got to be reliable and consistent over the long term. It, it, it's there. It is a remarkably flexible, flexible thing, and you just you've got to keep talking to people. And if you make a mistake, I, which I've done in times, same the wrong thing, go back, re, rewind it, let them know, put the money back in, and it's, it's all right. It's, it's just you've just got to be reliable and consistent through the whole period. And Des, can I sound you out on our recommendation around price deregulation? Do you have any yeah, views I, on that recommendation? I, yeah, I think the pricing commissioner sounds good to me. I think that's a great idea. And, it, you know, because maybe in different regions, because you could think about Queensland with its regional area, the costs out in rural communities. Mm -hmm. And, like, I, I know, like one of my instead of being carers to me said, I ran over 15 minutes. And I said to him, oh, mate, sorry about this, you know. He said, oh, that's no worry. He said, often I'm driving back 40 minutes out of town working with a real customer for work. And I thought, he's, he's probably not getting paid that much. And he'd drive 40 hours, 40 minutes on a Friday afternoon. That's a long 40 minutes. But then again, people in Brisbane do that every day of the week, don't they? Mm. You know, I know when I run a travel agent, I spoke to her about all the stoplights in town. Yeah, she's... She went through something like 40 stoplights to get to work. Wow. Mm. Makes her realise, yeah, depends where you live in Australia. You know, 40 minutes isn't that much when you compare to certain areas. But you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, you know, carers doing, doing work for not much money sometimes and, and short periods of employment and, and flex. And like one week they've got... Uh, five hours, the next week they've got 45 hours. Mm. You know, it's, people have got to pay rent still. Rents are high in the region. Mm. So there's lots of factors that go into scarcity of the workforce. Mm. Because you think that this pandemic, you'd have plenty of workers mm. involved. So another... People are motivated to come mm. to work and, and, and they, they, they don't mind taking people shopping, they don't mind taking people university or school, but the personal care, it's mm. not for everyone. Another set of recommendations that we have, Des, is around increasing the supply of information to NDIS participants on price and quality as a way yeah. of uh, allowing them to make informed decisions and exercise choice and control. I'd be really interested in your perspective around uh, you know, how you go about finding the supports for yourself and whether that information, if it was more readily available, would actually be a good thing in making the most of your plan. The, the thing about, you know, you've got um, choice. 
and it's a much better word for rent. But you have choice to care. The thing about carers, you've got choice about your carers, but they've got choice about who they work for. Mm. The number one thing I'm going to do, if I've got a carer who turns up, you know, they may have political views, they may have lots of different views on things, totally different things. But you know, the worker that turns up, I've worked with them, I don't, I really, really say nothing, I don't ever send someone, it might be once a year maybe, or once every three years, with lots of carers. It's, it's, you just work with the people you've got that they, they will do a better job if you explain them why and you know, that there's a reason why you're doing it this way. And, and then if they're not, they're not changing over time, well, that's when it can be a problem. So most people will, you know, work your way if it's, if, if it's sensible and, you know, safe for them. You're not, you're not trying to, you're trying to provide a safe environment. People, I always feel like my carers come in. I always say things like, "Cut yourself a cup of tea and make sure the aircon's on," because I just feel my feel my mother looking down at me if I wasn't being nice to my carers. You know, because anyone come into our house, they got treated like a like royalty. So, Des, uh, I'm conscious of time. Are there any final remarks or observations you'd like to share with us? No, I just think I'd like to know more about that, which is based employment strategy by the federal government, and I'd love to see what they do about it. It's, it's got to get a lot more critical focus in the future because, obviously, it's it's critical to the to the NDIS assessment, but it's it's based on that fact that the employment rate will, will improve over time and lessen the, the tax cost of this whole package. So it, it's it's in everyone's benefit to get employment work. And uh, when, when we first started looking at this employment, I was asked, asked what's going away and looking at oh, I was actually looking at, at the uh, volunteer side as well. And our group, our group, uh, employers and consultants. We met with, with, with the Archbishop of the Anglican Church and we also, one of the other members met with the Bishop of the Catholic Church. We talked about it so it says, it said basically things like, well, you know, the church have a moral role and here's a role for the church to look at. They've got, there's a lot of workers that work for the church in different roles. And, um, you know, we could just volunteer if we had a volunteer coordinator. And there was talk about them putting some money in for a, a um, coordinator that would coordinate that that role of volunteer person taking up, searching out, finding volunteer opportunities for people with disability. Because there, there was a place in West Australia that had done that over a long time that I'd come across, and they had had some success. And I mean, it's success like that builds more success, doesn't it? When you get a successful employment, employment outcome, which is basically an employment outcome, as good as an employment outcome for an organisation. Well, a lot of a lot of um, places in the world, in Australia, have a role for volunteers. It's probably going to be a, a bigger factor in the future with, you know, ageing ageing population, and um, the more. The more you sit around home doing nothing, the more you lose, you lose you know, your skills, your health, everything. Mm -hmm. Well, look, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and um, we appreciate your observations and wish yes. you well, Des. Yes, thanks, Karen. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. So we might just have a short break and I'll invite um, our next presenter in Montague from National Disability Services to join us shortly. Thank you.